And now on Tucson Business Radio X, your home for real estate with Carol Nugget. Well, hello, everybody. My name is Carol Nugget, your home for real estate, and I'm very pleased to welcome everyone to the inaugural show of my new Tucson Business Radio X program, Your Home for Real Estate. Or as I like to think about it, is your radio home for real estate. And we're going to use the time on all of these shows to really talk about all the ins and outs of real estate to be informative, to be educational, and hopefully also entertaining. And today I have selected as our first topic a brand new phenomenon that we're seeing in the real estate industry called iBuyers. Now, those of you who are listening, if you don't know what I'm talking about, if you've seen billboards, if you've been receiving letters at your home or postcards from people wanting to buy your home and promising that they're going to give you a great price at great convenience, uh, chances are you do know what an iBuyer is. And so for today's show, I've called on some experts. Uh, my first guest is Jim Bowman, who is the vice president and the branch manager of Caldwell Banker Residential Brokerage. And Jim is originally from Pontiac, Michigan, but he's been here in Tucson for 49 years. 34 of those years, he's been was a realtor in, in Tucson. That's so he, he really knows the, the industry very well. And prior to working at Caldwell Banker, he was with some other brokerages, but he's been with Caldwell Banker, a residential brokerage, for 24 years, the last 19, serving as the manager in several of the Tucson offices. Uh, and Jim is a licensed associate broker. He's a certified residential manager. He serves as a director for the multiple listing service. Some of you know that is the MLS of Southern Arizona. And he's been honored as the recipient of the Coldwell Banker Manager of the Year Award, the Spirit of Leadership Award, and the coveted Robert K. McCord Memorial uh, Award. And last but not least, Jim is very proud to be a husband, a father, and a grandfather. So welcome, Jim, and thank you thank so you. much for coming. And my next guest is Samantha High, who is a li licensed realtor with Caldwell Banco Residential Brokerage. She is a colleague of mine. And Samantha is a very seasoned real estate professional, and she works very hard and is committed to assisting buyers, sellers, and, and investors navigating the local Tucson market. So I'm grateful that you're here today, too. Thank you. And I did have a third. I really wanted to provide everyone with an overview uh, of the I buying um, experience, and I did have uh, an escrow officer, but unfortunately, as sometimes happens in the real estate industry, something important came up. So Donna Peterson of Title Security won't be able to be with us today, <coughs> but I did get a chance to talk with Donna, uh, and I'll later on, if I have the opportunity, I'll be sharing the perspective that she has in terms of the, the very crucial um, financial transaction that the escrow uh, officers handle for us in real estate. So what I really wanted to start with, I gave a little bit of information about iBuyers, but I think we really need to start and talk about what is an iBuyer. Jim, would you like to start? Sure, there's uh, several companies that are out there uh, that uh, offer iBuyer services. And, and in a nutshell, really what happens is that there's an outside entity uh, and generally there's a company that uh, is fronting the money, but also a real estate company usually that is accompanied with that in many cases. Um, and they normally ask a homeowner if they'd like to sell their home. And the way that they um, basically pose it is that there's no real estate commissions uh, and that they offer a lower price, an initial offer for the house that is significantly lower uh, than its market value, but they promote it as it's a quick way uh, to get out of the home. Uh, and so they make a significantly lower offer. Uh, they still do an, uh, an inspection. Often they come back with a list of repairs and ask that that also be converted uh, into a lower price. They usually attach a dollar amount and ask it to go down the price even more. Um, they, although they don't charge a commission for that, there are fees that are involved, often even more than what the commission would be. Okay, and in fact, just to, um, just to add a little bit of information to that, I've done a lot of research on this, and 
the fast the uh, data that I've seen, according to Market Watch, which is a reputable resource based on actual sales, is that sellers who sell to an I buyer are usually uh, their net is 12 to 18 percent less than had they gone on the open market yeah. with uh, with the traditional realtors. So yeah. that's that's the statistics that we're seeing in the marketplace. There's yeah. been several articles that have been written, those sort of things. That uh, now that it's kind of out there, although they may take and say there's no commission, often it's much higher than even what the commission would have been. Correct, correct. And so I'm curious because you've been in the business for a long time. Do you think that there is a place in the market for the iBuyer type of transaction? Well, our, our industry is ever evolving. Uh, there is always disruptors that are in our industry. Uh, as both of you guys well know, we see things that are changing and evolving all the time. Uh, luckily, our company, we are evolving uh, as well. We also have an iBuyer program that's being launched across the country. It's different, um, but we do have one of our own. And so, you know, the, pretty much for anything in, in our business, there is a niche market for that. So, um, you know, there are uh, instances, I suppose, where somebody needs to take and do a, a really, really quick sale and they are willing to take a significant loss mm -hmm. for what it really is worth on the open market. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I've, I've heard examples of somebody that, you know, if someone would pass away and they would need to take and have the proceeds, the heirs very quickly, you know, for burial or settle on estate, then it might be that way. Mm -hmm. um, so there may be a, a, an application for that. But for most sellers uh, to take and lose thousands and thousands of dollars um, because you don't want to wait a couple of weeks, uh, generally that doesn't fit into most people's plans. But I'm sure there are uh, a few applications where it would be. Okay. And, Sam, I know you have done some transactions. Jim was talking about uh, I buyers purchasing properties from individuals who are looking to sell. Mm -hmm. And I know that you've been involved in some transactions with individuals buying from iBuyers, is that correct? From uh, listed yeah, properties I've, that are listed by iBuyers? Absolutely, and I've, I've actually been on both sides of the spectrum as kind of a consultant from the selling side, and Jim's absolutely right. There is going to be a scenario, one out of 10, one out of 20, one out of 100, it's still new and emerging, so we don't really have the data on how popular this is going to be, but options are good, and I think the misleading thing is typically in our environment, technology makes things cheaper, it makes things more accessible. Right. This is a case that it's not necessarily cheaper and there is a cost for the convenience. And to your point, sometimes it's $5,000, sometimes it's $10,000. I went on a listing appointment and uh, my sellers were really not sure what they were gonna do. It was a rental property. They uh, weren't really sure the kind of condition they were in. They were really nervous about putting it on the market and having to deal with negotiations and selling and all that. So they got one of the, the offers and I uh, took a look at it and it was incredibly low, incredibly low. It was about $95,000 less than what we ended up listing it for and selling it for. Wow. Um, so, I mean, it, it, it can be all over the map and I'm grateful for the candid conversation I was able to have with those sellers around it. And I think the public needs to know that it is a resource, it's a tool, and the skilled professionals in the real estate market you know, that's good information for them to have because yes. we we know in a very, very concrete way dynamics about neighborhood and dynamics about market trends that are so, so, so specific to the pulse of your block where, you know, somebody sitting in Minneapolis on a computer with a algorithm isn't going to know those things. And so, you know, sometimes there might be a really good deal. I had a seller once that she actually had a pretty good offer for what, what was it going to take to get her home in, in good shape. Um, she'd lived there for like 50 years. You know, it was a pretty good offer and she went that direction. It wasn't worth the trouble. She mm -hmm. needed to get out fast. Her husband had just passed away, you know, really unique situation. But most of the time it's not it's not for most sellers. You know, your home is your biggest asset. Most people aren't going to gamble with that. Right. You know, most keep people, even if you invest in stocks or other elements, you know, 5,000, 10,000, hundreds of thousands of dollars, mm -hmm. most people want a skilled professional and not going through the muddy waters on their own. And when it comes to what happens next, once these properties are taken by the companies, uh, at the end of the day, they are investors. Investors like to profit. They do pad in a profit margin. You know, that's what they're in the business for. They don't want to own properties. They want to make money. 
And so when these properties do go on the market, they're usually priced pretty competitively. So, uh, and they usually have a model that actually helps uh, buyers see them very easily, which buyers love. Uh, but it is a little bit tricky na to navigate. I mean, on, on many levels uh, for a buyer, somebody interested in buying these properties, because a lot of times the individual selling them has never seen the property. Almost similar to when we saw a lot of foreclosures and distressed listings where it was really limited in the type of information you knew and no one would really tell you what's happened with it. Uh, we're kind of seeing that now in a different way. And so, you know, navigating these transactions once they are on the market uh, has really added just a new element to our business that we didn't see before. Well, let me, I, I think it might be beneficial for our listeners to just separate slightly I buying in terms of an individual who might be interested in listing or selling their home and how I buyers, which you've started talking a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then we'll talk a, a little later about what it's like if you're looking to buy a home that's been listed by an I buyer, because mm -hmm. as you said, I think th there's some great differences in as an agent, as a realtor, when I show an I buyer to pr prospective buyers, that's very different. Mm -hmm. So, but for just a moment, I just want to stay on the selling side because I, I think that there's um, a couple of things, and you alluded to this. Most individuals, if they're listing their home for sale and they're working with a realtor, number one, they get represented. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the concerns that I have is an individual who sells their home to an I buyer, they have no representation. Now, there are models, uh, I know there are agents in Phoenix doing this, where they are stepping in and representing uh, a seller to an I buyer who wants to purchase it, but that just costs that individual even more money. <laughs> That's correct. And, and actually, what I love that Samantha said was, you know, information uh, is educational and, right. it, and it is freeing in especially this case because, um, you know, the big thing that I buyer purchases come with is, is the expediency. That's right. It's quick. Uh, that kind of thing. But what most sellers need to know in, in the Tucson market today, the average sales time to get their house sold is 33 days. That's pretty quick anyway. So if you're doing an iBuyer and it's going to take a couple of weeks anyways, mm -hmm. do you really want to give up thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars of your equity in your home just by waiting another couple of weeks? Uh, and so expediency sounds great that it's quick, but our market is very quick anyways. Mm -hmm. And if somebody is willing to take and drop their price or sell their house for thirty, forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 less, they might as well just list it the traditional way mm -hmm. and just list it very aggressively. They'll still make much more money and it will sell really quickly anyways. Mm -hmm. Well, and the other thing that I, I, from the sellers that I've been talking to, what they're the most surprised about, and Jim, you talked about this earlier, is they think that because there's no commission, they're going to have a, a, a greater net profit. Well, and then they find out about the service fees, but those aren't necessarily disclosed up front. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I think is really important uh, for sellers to understand is in a normal real estate transaction, repairs, if an inspection in d is done and there are any repairs needed on the house, that is a negotiation. So sellers and buyers negotiate you know, who's going to do those repairs or if there's going to be a credit given for those repairs. The I buyers go to sellers, have the inspection done, and they, at least my understanding, is they require the, the seller client to take care. They give them a list of repairs that they need to take care of. Mm -hmm. They get a punch list or they're That's asked right. to provide right. a credit. That's right. right. And so, that becomes an elephant in the room. Because and, it's, and it's not represented. They have no yeah. one to negotiate. Yep. You know, and I'm, as you both know, uh, being an educator f in my background, I'm all about representing our clients and protecting our clients. And mm -hmm. that, that's one of the concerns that I have for the sellers is I'm glad to hear that you've been consulting with some of your clients. But I think a lot of these people, uh, excuse me, a lot of sellers, or people considering selling, they don't really have anybody to help them mm -hmm. navigate what they're hearing from an eye buying brokerage. I'm all for people having choices. Mm -hmm. uh, and my intention in this program isn't to steer people one way or another. Everybody has a right to do whatever kind of transaction works best for them. I mean, 
When I ended up in Tucson, I had moved six times in three and a half years. <laughs> Nobody knows more than me how horrible it is mm-hmm. to go through the process of, of moving and listing and escrow and showing. So I certainly understand where it can be very inviting for people. And I think that's great mm-hmm. as long as people also understand that there's a price that you pay for that kind of convenience and that expediency. There is, and there's actually several prices that you pay. So I know you spoke to one of our agents at our Valley agent, our office, and in their case with his seller, uh, the initial offer was extremely low, Mm -hmm. um, but they were interested. They figured, you know, for the expediency, they were willing to do that. Mm -hmm. Then after that, the next shoe dropped, and it turned out that there was going to be almost 14% in fees on top of that. And then in the end, they also came back with asking for a $10,000 credit for the Pairs. Uh, and in the end, our agent listed the property, sold it traditionally, uh, and they pocketed over $40,000 more. And it sold in a couple of weeks anyways. Uh, and so, you know, that's really what needs to happen is, is to make sure that they investigate the entire process uh, on one of it. And so, you know, everybody knows the old adage that um, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is too good to be true. Uh, And so, you know, we've already said that there may be a place for it on a limited basis, but for the average buyer, uh, and and Samantha's correct, that's usually some person's biggest nest egg. Mm -hmm. And if they're going to give a big piece of that away, how are you ever going to recover that, uh, you know? And so they have to treasure that and they have to protect that. Yes. And... um, Samantha, did you want to add anything to that? No, I just, I, I completely agree. And I think with sellers, you know, real estate agents, we are always here to consult. I think the public doesn't realize that we actually are all fingerprinted. We all actually are certified because our job is to protect the public. Mm-hmm. In, in the eyes of the law, that is what we are seen as doing. And so we are passionate about this, not because we're greedy, money-hungry real estate agents, but because we see what happens to our clients and then we'll get to it, but then we see what happens when these homes come back on the market. And and it's hard, you know, and it puts us in a, in a hard position to disclose and be honest and level set with people, you know, and I think it's really interesting the type of market that we're in where all of this is emerging. Because mm-hmm. could you imagine all this going on in a different in a different market speed you know and and i think because the market is aggressive it's almost a blessing because most people really should do their diligence and researching options before they just go for it um because our jobs is to make your life easy you know if you got kids and you got pets and you got schedules and you got all of these complicated things there is such a lack of inventory Mm -hmm. that your agent will be as creative as possible to make it as hassle free like when you're going to go to the zoo we'll have showings then you know whatever it needs to be you know we'll we'll make it worth your while and i think that more and more people are um aware of that in some ways you know the, the, they'll be strategic when they talk to their agent about what works for them what doesn't mm-hmm. but i think that the information should be out there that mm-hmm. don't just go with one of these companies because you think it's a quick fix because it's not it's maybe not what you think it is and and you know a good agent can help you navigate those waters and like i said i mean i've had clients that we looked at it and i'm like you know what this if this is the best thing for you you know go for it it's not a bad deal for you then you know mm-hmm. um But yeah, it it definitely comes with some risk uh, involved, for sure. Well, one of the things that I always uh, advise people in general is we know statistically that most people go with the very first realtor or real estate agent, which Mm -hmm. there is a difference between a realtor, a licensed realtor, and a real estate agent. And most people go with the first one. And so I've always encouraged people, even people that I'm you know, doing a listing presentation with, go ahead and interview two or three agents yeah. and really find out what's going on. And so I think sometimes the convenience of the eye buying, because it's very automated and it's it's almost hip in a way right? <laughs> a, 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 with getting your app, and we'll go into that in a minute, but uh, I think that people sometimes forget that, as you said, Jim, if it sounds too good, you know, it probably is too good. And you really need to go out and do your research Mm -hmm. and feel really, you know, the relationship that we as agents, as realtors have with our clients. I treasure my relationships. Mm -hmm. I value those relationships. Mm -hmm. And I work very, very hard to work with my clients and to represent them and to advocate for them and to get information, Mm -hmm. you know, as we've been saying, it's the most, you know, it's the biggest investment most people ever make in their lives. So I take that commitment very seriously. And I 
don't know that people are getting that kind of service when they're uh, they, working with a computer right. and an automated one eight hundred number <laughs> and you sit on hold or wait till they call you back and it's a very different experience. Yeah. Well, and the great thing is that because we do serve the public, getting that information and making an intelligent choice doesn't take days and weeks. I mean, if you call a realtor today and say, "I'd like to meet with you tomorrow," could you give me a market analysis of what Correct. my home is worth Correct. and what will your fees be and what it's going to cost? Um, you know, there's no reason to not be able to make an, an informed decision in just a couple of days. Unfortunately, on many of the iBuyer offers that come to a seller, there's a time limit. And so they give you three days or five days to make a decision. So there's a lot of pressure on the seller to take and say, oh, I need to make an immediate decision. And that's part of the process because uh, you have a limited time to get knowledgeable and to gather the information. There's a reason that you only are giving three to five yes. days so that you feel pressure to take and take that offer or it's off the table. Uh, and so you never want to make a rash decision when you're talking about your biggest investment of your life. Uh, I know, you know, our office, we have 160 agents in it. You can call the front desk right now and you will have an agent at your house in 20 minutes that will be happy to share for free uh, the market analysis on what your home is, is worth, provide you a cost sheet on what it will cost to sell that home and a reasonable expectation on the time that it will take it to sell it. And then that's really the information that you need to have before you take and get too far into the process. Well, and, and the other thing that I, th I want to bring up here, because, S Samantha, you alluded to it, the automated programs that iBuyers use are the exact same ones that we realtors use, with one exception. We use those as a starting point to determine the value of a house. Mm -hmm. Then we go out to the house. We take a look at the specific condition of the house. We take into consideration the upgrades. I mean, we do a tremendous amount of... Um, investigation and research. We're not just using the automated program. Mm -hmm. And that's what a lot of the, the iBuyer programs seem to be doing. They, they use it as their starting end and pretty much their ending point. Mm -hmm. And then from there, they're also taking out repairs, uh, service fees. fees. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, the one other point that I, I think it's important that the public know is that i buyers in my research i buyers are investors these are large groups large investor groups and their sole aim is to make money you know mm -hmm. and it's not that realtors aren't in business to earn livings and real real estate brokerages certainly are in business we couldn't sustain ourselves if we weren't productive and and profitable but there it's it's there's something about the fact that these are large investment groups who are really looking at these properties, not from the human perspective that we do, because we're dealing with the people. Mm -hmm. You know, most of the investors who are the backers of iBuyer programs, they, they've never seen the properties, they never see the people. They don't know the local market. They don't know and, the local market. And, they're, and that's actually a very that's candid that. fact that they do put in in a lot of the FAQs if you research it and dig in. Right. There's a lot of articles that are really candid about the fact that they're padding in a discount on top of all the extra stuff that we've already discussed. They're padding in a discount on whatever their automated values are because of the risk, because they don't actually right. really know that neighborhood. They don't know what if north of Ina is different than south of Ina. They don't know. They have no idea. And, and they so, charge a carrying they charge mm -hmm. a carrying cost. Yep. I had a deal actually where I represented a buyer. My buyers were out of the country. And the I buyer that I was working with wanted to close earlier and they were putting a lot of pressure. And they actually came out and said to me, Look, it's costing us hundred and fifty dollars a day to ca carry that house. We want to close earlier. And I said, I'm sorry. Sorry about that. First your of all <laughs> first of all, I couldn't get a hold of anybody to really talk to. But in texts and emails, I I finally was able or on the dashboard, I was finally able to communicate that the buyers could not close earlier because they weren't available. So yeah, there, there's. It's just a little different situation. Not that uh, it can't work for some people, but I think that 
the public needs to have more information. The information about how these brokerages, are they brokerages? I don't even know if they're legitimately generally, brokerages. Generally, generally there, there's two sides of them. Generally, <laughs> normally there's the business side. You may remember that Martha Apple was speaking at the, yeah. at the meeting. So there's normally kind of the money business side of it uh -huh. uh, that's kind of running the business entity. Then they also have a brokerage firm that is doing, because they have to have a real estate license to do that side of it. Uh, and so normally there's, there's almost two parts. It becomes confusing because usually the name of the company is the same for both of those entities and right. it gets a little blurry uh, the lines get blurred there when that happens and so but generally there's two parts to it okay well, th well that's good to know because one of the other experiences that I've had um, is some of number one and we're gonna have a whole discussion about this but communication seems to be the biggest issue here but one of the th things that I have experienced personally is I don't think that the people that I, when I've been able to get a hold of a human being, <laughs> I don't even know that the people that I've dealt with are actually licensed realtors. It's, uh, so I don't know that, and I don't want to uh, declare that because I simply don't know. But um, my some of the communications I've had have just been with people who are answering the phone. <laughs> well, As opposed to somebody who is a licensed realtor who, who has all of the responsibilities that we all talk about in, in the business, car load, what, we, what our obligations are to our clients. Yeah, we have a fiduciary duty, and yes. if you're a realtor, then you subscribe to you know, our ethics that we do. Uh, and so it is important to do those kind of things, and it's... Um, What's interesting is this is a pretty new phenomenon. Right. Uh, the companies are all pretty new. And so what's really happening now is they're learning what real estate is all about. You yes. know, our company has been around for over 110 years. We know what real estate's about. Mm -hmm. These companies are all pretty new. So now they're finding out what it means when there's a bad roof and there's a delayed closing and there's termites or there's a bad roof or a low appraisal. And they're not really prepared for those things because they're not seasoned in, that kind of, in our profession. Uh, and you do give that up. Uh, when you go that direction with them. In fact, I've had a situation with, again, in, a, in an actual transaction where I actually sat down with a representative of one of the iBuyer companies with the seller property disclosure, affectionately known in the industry uh, as a SPUDS, an acronym, the SPUDS. And I actually went over the seller property disclosure with the representative from the, uh, the iBuyer company and explained to him where it hadn't been filled out correctly. So that that's why I ask, are they even brokerages? Do they, as you said, I'm, I haven't been particularly impressed with some of the people that I've dealt with that, that they are knowledgeable. So I would just hope for the benefit of any any member of the public who's considering working with them that, that, they, that they find that out. And this brings me to another point. I like to call the iBuyers um, digital flippers because the truth is we've had people who are doing what i buyers are doing you know that we've sure. had them in the market sure. and you know we've all gotten the postcards and we've seen the commercials on tv uh, for people who are are going to buy your property low and they're basically doing the same thing that the i buyers are uh, but they aren't automated <laughs> and i want to just and this may take us into discussing the buyer perspective a, a, a little more but I want to talk about uh, the impact of these automated, uh, the, the automation of how iBuying has created automation in the real estate industry, because that's one of the biggest differences, and I, I think you would probably agree, kind of like we used to have car dealers and people, everybody went to the dealer and bought a car, now you can buy a car on your phone. That's what we're seeing in the real estate industry. And I know because uh, Donna Peterson from the, I asked her about the escrow perspective and she was saying that's the hardest thing from the perspective of escrow, which is the financial uh, tr transferring of the actual ownership of the property. She was saying that the automation is what's very, very challenging because you can't, again, you can't get a hold of an individual who's taking responsibility to make sure that the transaction uh, is completed effectively and efficiently. So I'm just curious from the buyer perspective, Samantha, mm -hmm. are, are you seeing that the automation is affecting your ability to conduct your business? Um, I. I would say that the 
availability of information is great. And I, I think that the buyers that are buying these properties on the market, I don't blame them for getting excited when they see it. And mm. the real reason I think that they are excited about it is that a lot of times it's easy to see, it's easy to show, they can look up a lot of public information. I think it's great that all that's out there and that everything is so easily automated. I mean, you can go to any website. I mean. I can't say names, but there just about any real estate website you go to, there's going to be an automated value that says, hey, this looks like it's in range, not in range. Click a button, we'll show you why we think why. Um, but to your point earlier, they don't know everything that we know. And so, you know, I think when a buyer's looking to purchase one of these properties, it's very similar almost to when you're purchasing a foreclosure or something in that element. And the reason to compare the two is really that you have an entity, whether it be a bank or an investor or a corporation, you have a, an entity that is doing this as a business. And when they are kind of, you know, three degrees apart from the property, a lot of times no one's actually ever stepped foot on the property. Mm -hmm. um, if there have been repairs done, it's a real mystery of who did them to what capacity. You, the elephant in the room of if the seller did pay for a credit for a new roof or repairs or whatever, did that happen? Where did that go? Did it happen? Did it not happen? There's a lot of mystery around it. And so, you know, when, when, a, when a buyer sees, when, when a public buyer, prospective buyer sees, hey, this, this property just sold for, say, 170000 now it's on the market for one seventy eight. wow, that's a really good deal. Mm -hmm. I mean, they could have got 50000 in credits for all we know from that seller, you know? So it kind of creates this unfair twist of what market value is. And so you, buyers really do need an agent in their back pocket if they're gonna purchase one of these homes because we, we have that kind of information we know how to ask for that type of information, dig in like you did with the seller disclosures, um, and just navigate the transaction. You know, like you said, there's a lot of people, a lot of chefs in the kitchen that'll handle one property file. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you really do need somebody that is incredibly disciplined in the constraints of your of the contract for your legal rights of what you can and can't do. Mm -hmm. And then you also have to have somebody very creative as a negotiator that knows like, okay, well, I want it done by Tuesday, that's not happening. How do I still best represent my client to get things done? Um, you know, and, and if Susie's not calling me back and all of a sudden John called me back, I just still have to, you know, keep it moving and do what's best for your client. And so I think that, you know, yes, information out there is good from the buyer side. We're in a really limited uh, market, like Jim said, Mark, you know, homes move quickly there's not a lot of homes available so if this is an avenue for sellers that are scared that think they could never sell their house because they've lived there 50 years to sell and move on then it's a great thing but it definitely needs to come with caution for sure yeah and go ahead Beth. Oh, well, what i was going to say is is where we're running into trouble when when and of course it's confusing because we say i buyer but they also become the seller yeah. right. so they buy right. it as an i buyer but then they end up being the seller correct and we're having a lot of that trouble right now where uh extremely understaffed uh uneducated to the process as you mentioned about with the uh, you know benzer and spuds those kind of things real estate is a very um labor intensive process uh, because the realtor <laughs> a labor does of love. it is a labor intense. well it, it, there's many many hours that go on behind the scenes that the public doesn't usually generally know mm -hmm. meeting and we hope contractors. it doesn't miscarry uh, mm -hmm. yeah. so you know we um, you know we meet people we meet inspectors we meet uh, you know locksmiths we meet termite people we meet appraisers we do all of those kind of things uh, and where we're having a lot of trouble and I and I stress a lot of problems is that you know we ask for receipts for repairs nobody knows where they are nobody wants to give them to us uh, we ask for evidence that the repairs have been done we ask for different things and recently we've run into many cases where they say well we don't have to do that or we don't have to do this thing or our attorney says we don't have to do that and we have to point out that part of the contract and say mm -hmm. you know your attorney does not trump arizona real estate law that's right and so even though your attorney says you don't have to provide that you don't have to disclose that we have to take and say you do you have to comply with the contract and so um unfortunately we're having to take and 
educate these i buyers and i sellers uh, on what the process is which you know normally on a commission we get half and they get half so the work is generally split 50 50 but in these cases we're doing 80 percent of the work uh, and getting half of the money which the money's not the important thing it's our clients are having to go through that process and we have buyers that are saying, please provide me the warranties. Please provide me the receipts for the, you know, for the repairs that were done on this prob property. Uh, and, and normally we get those. And normally we have them in plenty of time for closing. But uh, we are going through the process now where we are begging for them or begging for the keys or begging for garage door openers or begging that the repairs get done on time uh, and, and saying, please just follow the contract. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, they, they don't. Yes, and, and I'm going to have something to say about that, too. But first, I just want to let all of our listeners know. This is Carol Nygut. You're listening to Your Home for Real Estate on Tucson Business Radio X. Broadcasting on the studio is in the Stewart Title Building on Broadway. And I am a residential realtor here in Tucson. I am dedicated to representing my clients, educating them, informing them, and that is what gave me the motivation to start this radio show. And I'm delighted that today I have two highly respected colleagues of mine, Jim Bowman, the Vice President and Regional Manager. Did I get that right? So, regional Vice President there you and go. Manager. Regional of... <laughs> Vice President for Coldwell Banker Residential Brokerage. Thank you. Close enough. And thank you. And Samantha High, who is one of our expert award-winning realtor is a colleague of mine and we t and former rookie of the year former rookie rookie of the yeah first year in real estate rookie of the year yeah yeah i didn't know that congratulations yeah, that's wonderful and we are discussing today this phenomenon of i buying which is the technological uh transaction of conducting uh real estate um and we're talking about the pros and the cons. And before the, this little break, Jim was talking about some of the challenges that uh, realtors who represent buyers of these properties that are being sold by iBuying uh, brokerages. Some of the challenges, and I just want to give you a little bit of information. One of the things that I have found very frustrating, because I am absolutely dedicated to to making the process as stress-free as possible. What I always tell my clients is a real estate transaction is stressful. There's no way you can get around it. But my intention is to absorb as much of that stress on the path of my clients as I can to make it easier for them. And I was involved, I've been involved in several iBuyer uh, transactions where I represented the buyer. I was showing properties that were owned and being listed by I buyers, and also where I represented people actually in a purchase transaction. And we went to do the walkthrough, which is a part of the contract. We couldn't access the house because um, Sam, you mentioned this, but I want to clar clarify it. To look at one of the iBuyer properties, all you have to do is load an app onto your phone, just like you would any other app. And so the general public can let themselves in and out of, of properties. Um, but I was standing at the property. My clients had come in from California, and we had scheduled the final walkthrough. Following that, we were going to go to the escrow office for the signing, which is a very normal, normal procedure, protocol. normal protocol. And we couldn't access the house. And it took me 20 minutes while my buyers were standing there, texting people, calling people, finding any way I could to get into that house for what their legally rightful walkthrough. <laughs> um, then there was an issue with my getting the keys. This, there was an issue where the water had been turned off because they were doing repairs, and they hadn't turned the water back on. And I generously got in touch with a contact that I did have and said, you know, I'm just not sure that you want to pay to have the inspector come back out again because the Arizona purchase contract states very clearly that all utilities have to be on for the inspections. So, you know, e we all know that even in transactions where we are working with a human agent on the other side, Things happen, sure. you know, and there are complications. And sometimes the biggest frustration that I think a lot of agents have is when you can't get a hold of that other agent. Mm -hmm. 
you know, or they're not returning paperwork or they're not, you know, providing their receipts and you're calling and calling and calling. And my experience with iBuying, because you don't have a, a human being with a phone number or an email who is your primary contact, you might be given that information, mm -hmm. but they aren't available. They don't respond. All of the transactions are done on a dashboard. And so for m what I've experienced is I cannot provide the kind of service to my buyers that I want to provide to them. And I have actually had buyers, when I've been showing these properties, tell me that they don't want to see any more of them. In one case, I had people who had dogs, the back doors, as you may know, you've, they permanently lock off s some of the doors, which I understand from their perspective, they want to prevent people from accessing the properties, although we all know that that's going on anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but there was th they don't provide property books which is a standard for a, a highly skilled professional realtor, always make sure that there's a property book in any listing. So I couldn't get information. And that was very, very frustrating for me. And I felt like it, it, I couldn't serve my buyer clients as well. So I'm just wondering, I know you had mm -hmm. mentioned that a lot of information is available. And I agree that for, especially for the generation that's used to searching right. for everything online. Right. But that would be you. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, I'm a little older than you are. And a lot of our age, our clients are, aren't of that in inclination that they're going to get on and start searching. And I sure. feel that that's part of what we owe them. as Well, and, and it's interesting, too, because <laughs> in all the information available, half of the time, most of it's wrong. Most of it's incorrect. Flood yes. zone? Yes. No, it's not. Yeah. Uh, EVAP, or does it have AC? Sure, yes, it has AC. No, it doesn't. It has an EVAP cooler. You know, we, we see these things, these incorrect, you know, details on listings all the time. And again, it goes back to because nobody's actually been at the house. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the person that's putting the listing in, has ne they don't even, they have no idea where that property is. Well, and I just had it happen where, and it was, this was public information in the multiple listing service listing that the roof had recently had work done on it and that it was warranted, mm -hmm. which was why they would not do the work that our right. roofing inspection requested. And I got a call from that client last week that, now that they own the house, they contact. I, it took me a long time to get the warranty. They contacted the roofer, and the roofer said, well, as a courtesy to you, we're going to come out and take a look at the finishing edge that the inspection uh, pointed out. But we were told when we did this work that they did not want to provide a warranty. Mm -hmm. So, And, again, human agents can make mistakes sure. in their listings but that's part of our due diligence is that we as agents again we represent and we advocate for the clients and 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 it's very frustrating when i'm trying to be an advocate for my client and i just simply walk up against a brick wall and i can't find any information mm -hmm. well and carol it, you know. if i could swing the conversation back a little bit to when you're a seller that is con contemplating selling to an i buyer company uh, the one the thing that I think about and I try to compare it to is a pawn shop. So we all know what a pawn shop is. And so you can take your grandmother's diamond ring in today, and if you want it to be expedient and you want to get quick money and you have an emergency that you need to, you can take your grandmother's diamond ring in, and they'll give you $100 very quickly and very quick. But that diamond ring may be worth $5,000. Mm -hmm. uh, and so most people would never think of taking a diamond ring in and taking and getting just pennies on the dollar for what it really is worth, but they're thinking about it for their own home. Mm -hmm. That's and right. so that's what they're doing. They're taking their home to the pawn shop mm -hmm. and say, I want money right now, really fast. I'm willing to take it a deep discount to be able to pawn my home. Mm -hmm. uh, and most people, if you ask them, would they do that with their wedding ring would say, absolutely not. Mm -hmm. But when they uh, get a letter in the mail that says, Hey, we might buy your home at this lower level with these kind of fees, they say, well, maybe I would. Mm -hmm. And so that needs to be part of the education process to really think of it that way is would you pick up your house and run into a pawn shop and say, what will you give me right mm -hmm. now so I can have a quick sale and some quick cash? Uh, or would you rather wait a couple of extra weeks and really get what that diamond ring is worth? Yeah, that's a very that's that's a good analogy. I hadn't really thought about that. Sam, I'm just wondering um, 
I know that you do a lot of work with investors, mm -hmm. and I believe, pa aka pawnbrokers. <laughs> <laughs> but I I know that when we had discussed this earlier, you're seeing that the I buyers are really having an impact yeah. on the traditional real estate investors. Yeah, it's hard out there, man. I mean, I think that the investors are are not ever talked about because no one's worried about them. But it is, you know, the market is already really tight. Yeah. Really tight. And I think, you know, investors are, you know, there's a joke that like, luckily, investors aren't a protected class. I mean, their, their <laughs> offers are always looked at last, you know, like people don't want to let them in the in the home to see it, you know. So investors, it, it, it can be tough anyway. But, you know, in a typical investor cash quick close situation, our standard of practice when you're working with an investor, it's as is close, you know, do your due diligence, they bring in their contractors, they do their stuff. And then and they kind of build their budget of what it's going to take. And they it's a different business. Mm -hmm. It's a very different business. Well, and I would agree with that. So so I have no problem with investors because they're in it to make money. That's mm -hmm. fine. Mm -hmm. I don't have a problem with that. And so they do traditionally take and make a lower offer because mm -hmm. sometimes they have to build in what it's going to take and cost to resell right. that house, take and rehab it to get it back on the market, put in whatever they want for a profit margin. What they don't do compared to an iBuyer is they also don't take and put in 6 to 14% exactly. of the fee. Yeah. Uh, and so so uh, that's the, the difference there because I have no problem if somebody's trying to buy a property at a good price mm -hmm. uh, or even a great price. And they uh, usually use agents because they know they, that we right. know the that's market. Right. You know, I work with a lot of investors and they count on our expertise to, to know what where where to navigate, you know. And they also really, their, their opportunity for profit comes in when they set their selling price. Mm -hmm. but, and when they set their selling price, they're subject to an appraisal. Right. If their buyer is financing, which primarily they're going to be, you know, financed by a lending institution. Mm -hmm. And so they're subject to the same rules and regulations and legal requirements as a traditional sale. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, in the investors anymore, you know, someone, it, it would be common sense that if you were going to maybe entertain a, an I buyer offer for the sale of your home, you might call a local, we'll, we'll give you cash as is, no questions asked, but you're really not comparing apples to apples mm -hmm. to Jim's point. And, you know, I think that there is a, um, I, I don't know, I wouldn't say level of respect there, but there is kind of a, you know, investors don't farm your house, you know, they're not going to put signs out, they're not going to show up every day and push you to, you know, they, they sometimes will send out lists, uh, they'll get lists of people that look like they have equity or been there for a mm -hmm. long time, they will kind of target people that maybe could be a good buy for them. But overall, you know, they're, they're in it for a different reason. They're, it's a totally different game ball game for them. Well, in any kind of investor, um, many of us are investors for whether it's stocks or bonds or whatever it is. I mean, the whole game there is to buy low and sell high. Right. Right. And so for an investor, that's a calculated risk with calculated real numbers. And so they do say, hey, we need to get it at this price. It's going to cost this much to rehab it or get it back on the market. We have carrying costs. We have prices of what it's going to talk to, you know, up all the things to take and resell it again. And on top of that, they try to take and put a regional profit in there. They don't just come in and lowball an offer and just try to take and make a ton of money. Mm -hmm. uh, not that they wouldn't do that, but that's really not what the program is. The road program really is multifaceted based on mathematics mm -hmm. that, hey, we've got to get it at this price to take and be able to do this, this, resell right. it and make some profit. And many investors are working on a five or 10 percent profit margin, not hundreds not, of thousands of dollars. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. So I want to just get to a couple of questions um, that our escrow officer thought might be useful for people to have this information. Number one, and I found it was interesting, uh, but apparently uh, Donna Peterson, our escrow officer who was going to appear with us today, told me that a lot of people question whether they even need an escrow officer when they're dealing with an eye buyer. And I, I think that probably comes from the fact that the model is you're on your computer or you're on your mobile and everything is done, the whole transaction. It's almost as if it's, it's, as if it's an an electronic transfer of funds without any kind of an escrow officer. So yes, you do need uh, to have an escrow officer every real estate transaction 
requires an escrow officer to, to, and for those of you who don't know, escrow, I like to think of it as it's the neutral ground where all of the financial uh, and property research is done, and escrow officers are independent of the buyer or the seller. They work for both sides. So if, if I haven't portrayed that accurately, you are both welcome to... No, I mean, it's uh, the, the escrow company actually works for the contract, uh, and right. so the term is a disinterested third party, mm -hmm. and so they follow the, the directions uh, and instructions from the contract. Uh, and so, the, you know, I would always recommend that somebody does use an escrow company, and often we interchange the words of a title company yes. and an escrow company, but it actually is two separate things. The titling portion of that gives and issues the title insurance, mm -hmm. and the escrow officer and the escrow process is compliant the paperwork, doing the research, that kind of thing, uh, settling the account. And so uh, I would always take and recommend that somebody finds a very competent uh, escrow company and title company to take and complete their transaction. And another piece, just as information, I want anybody who hears this who's considering working with an iBuyer, I just want you to be aware that while it's not a legal requirement in the Tucson area at least, it's customary that buyers can select the escrow officer because buyers are the ones who open the escrow. Escrow is opened at the time that the earnest money is deposited. And that's another thing because um, many of these iBuyers, they're conglomerates and they have their own escrow companies. And uh, so there, there's some encouragement and agents who aren't as experienced might feel like they need to use that escrow officer. And those are national escrow companies because these are national uh, entities, I buyers. And Donna Peterson was telling me that that's an issue that they have run into, that when they're working with these national escrow companies, they aren't familiar with the local customs, the local transaction processes. As we know, in, for example, in Arizona, we're the only state in the union that requires a specific pre-qualification form as opposed to just a pre-approval letter. So every market does have certain idiosyncrasies. And Donna was telling me that that is a problem that they've had in terms of doing escrow. And she also indicated that it's, there is some frustration. Once they are able to get through with these automated programs once they're able to get through it's been very efficient because they are automated mm -hmm. but again the frustration is being able to communicate and locate somebody who who they can actually address uh one-to-one -one. so i think we're coming close to the end of our time i'm wondering from your perspective as an agent i've stated my opinion i'm wondering what would you say are the the benefits and the risks of an eye buyer, or what would you recommend um, anyone in the public who's considering an eye eye buyer? Any tips? Uh, kind of, you know, just to summarize what we spoke about before, I would just, I mean, my biggest recommendation is get involved with a real estate agent. Ask your friends, ask your family. Uh, somebody, everybody knows an agent. Maybe it's not a great one, but if you keep asking, you will find a good agent that can consult with you and you know get the right information whether you're looking to buy or sell uh, there are absolutely different obstacles and different things to look out for and everybody hates calling 1-800 numbers and sitting on hold everybody hates that that's one of the most infuriating things that we deal with right and so why selling a house which to your point is one of the most stressful frustrating things and emotional things that you go through you want to deal with a 1-800 number that's just whether you're on the sell side or the buy side you really do need somebody that's skilled and knows what they're doing um, because there are advantages for a seller if they if there is a life situation and there's gonna be you just got deployed you got equity you got to get out you don't want to hear about it in a week you're you know family trust something happened you've never you you live in you know out of out of the country maybe or if you have five kids and the idea of getting the house ready for showing oh my gosh <laughs> yeah if you've got five kids and i mean there's gonna be reasons why it's appealing right. you know and, and it's just not about the money you just need it you know you need to make an offer on the next home and your next home is actually more important to you than mm -hmm. your current home you're willing to take a loss there's gonna be reasons but there's risks mm -hmm. absolutely you need to go in informed you need to go in knowing what your market value could be 
uh, I think, as a seller. And for a buyer, there, you know, the really the benefit for buyers right now is just because we have such limited inventory. Mm -hmm. It's giving more options for buyers. Uh, usually in our market, what we're seeing right now is it's mostly single family homes. A lot of them are at affordable price points. Uh, so that is good as far as a benefit for a buyer. But there's a lot of risks, a lot of risk when it comes to a buyer side. I think buyers have a perception sometimes that real estate agents cost them money. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's just not the case when you're buying a transaction a lot of those like we talked about costs padded in the those sellers that you know purchase the property as an investment they expect you to use it, an agent mm -hmm. you not doing it is going to just discredit yourself you know you're going to put yourself at a disadvantage especially when the mo the waters get muddy and they're not paying att attention to transaction timelines and you're not really sure what your rights are or you're on hold or the person that you had is on vacation for three weeks and you don't know what to do uh, so I mean there's definitely pros and cons for both buyers and sellers I think just being informed asking questions um you know it's never going to go away i think it's going to involve i think jim's right i think we're going to see that in time it's maybe going to become a little bit more efficient they're still learning about the business we've been doing it for years so um you know it'll be interesting to see how how it evolves and i think you know thank you for creating such a great platform to have as a as a topic because i think if it's not discussed it does become kind of taboo and look like it's a competition but it they're in our industry they're they're basically our little brothers and little sisters that we have to teach them That's if they're right. going to be in our world and they're going to work with our clients that we value and have relationships mm -hmm. with they need feedback and we need to you know be collaborative about how we make it win for everybody well and i i think Another thing that I, I, I just want to state pretty clearly is a lot of the people who are attracted to these programs are the younger people because they are. We know now that I believe the last I heard it was 60 percent of real estate transactions. You know, they're looking mo on mobile. They're finding out about things on mobile. Mm -hmm. So we know that it's a generation of buyers or potential buyers and sellers who are very used to working on devices. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just feel very strongly that we really need, as you said, to in inform and educate them so that they don't make a mistake or they don't have a regret or they they just know what they're really getting themselves in for right and i think that's the biggest thing is informed you know information informed decisions no one no one likes surprises you know mm -hmm. getting into a situation where you didn't know a hundred things about the property that is never a fun situation but if you if you know a hundred things about the property even if they're unfavorable but you still want to proceed mm -hmm. then at least you've you you're in a better place and i think that that's where the agents really well come in. and and as we we just had a, a session with our managing broker the other day and as we hear all the time and she reiterated the number one most important rule guiding the real estate industry is disclose 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 mm -hmm. you know and we have a 10-day minimum that's built into our contract but it can be extended we have a 10-day due diligence programs uh, excuse me period so that when we represent buyers we can go out and get all the possible information that we need and my concern about the i buyers is i think we need a due diligence <laughs> period for i buyers mm -hmm. well and, and carol you know we talk about educating the public and and you've <laughs> talked about younger people and millennials and they're yeah. used to that but you know this word needs to take and get out to everybody That's including right. your relatives mm -hmm. and your parents and everything else and that is our worry my mother's 87 years old she has called me four times because mm -hmm. she She's received a letter in the mail mm -hmm. that says she can sell her house for this amount in a couple of weeks. And so my fear is, is that we are going to take and unfortunately have the unsophisticated or the elderly be taken yep. advantage of mm -hmm. because they're going to get this. They're not going to check it out. They don't know the resources to find out the information. And then what they're going to do is they're going to sell their house at a greatly discounted price and be taken advantage of. Yeah. Which and sounds so. great to them, probably. You know, our market has appreciated so much so quickly that they're like, wow. And especially, <laughs> prize. especially because I've dealt with elderly parents myself, and they're so proud. Mm -hmm. I could see where someone would be very tempted to take an iBuyer offer because they don't want to bother their children. Mm -hmm. Well, in my They'd mother's case, uh, <laughs> she paid 20, she's lived there a long time. Yeah. She paid $27,000 for that house many centuries, or not, decades ago, <laughs> decades ago. Uh, and um, so when she got the offer, she thought it was fantastic. Yeah. When I ran a market analysis for it, it was almost $50,000 under what the true value of her home was. Yeah. 
Well, this is Carol Nygut, your home for real estate, your radio home for real estate, and I've been visiting today with Samantha High, one of our ace realtors at Caldwell Banker Residential Brokerage in the Foothills, and with Jim Bowman, regional vice president and manager of the Foothills office for uh, Caldwell Banker Residential Brokerage. I am a licensed realtor with Coldwell Banker Residential Brokerage in the Foothills. I'm delighted to be able to be sharing this information with you. Uh, and I also want to encourage you, this is a forum for the public. I would love for anyone who's interested in real estate, if you have a question, if you have a comment, if you have a topic that you would like to see addressed, please feel free. You can contact me at your home for real estate at Gmail. And I'm sure you can call Tucson Business Radio X. We and this show is available on the Tucson Business Radio X website. It's also streaming. It's available on Apple Podcasts. And I'm just delighted to have this opportunity, and I look forward to discussing my next show, which I'm hoping will be all about what's happening on 4th Avenue. There's a big real estate story going on down there, and I'm hoping in November to be able to bring you more information about that. So thanks so much for listening. We hope you enjoyed your Home for Real Estate with Carol Nygut on Tucson Business Radio X, 103.5 FM.